Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. This is an amazing crowd in the room, and I know it's an amazing crowd online as well. Because there's nothing happening politically in Iowa, right? Um, I'm Connie Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of Interfaith Alliance of Iowa and Action Fund, and I'm so grateful to each of you who care so passionately and so much about reproductive health care, including access to safe and legal abortion. Thank you for being here. Thank you for using your voices. I want you to raise your hand if you were at the State House last Tuesday. You can raise your hand online as well. You all are amazing. I want you to raise your hand if you have contacted your legislator at any point about abortion and access to safe and legal abortion. Raise your hand online also. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for standing up for people who need reproductive health care. Thank you for using your voices. Thank you for being present today. I am delighted to have um, some friends hanging out with us today. This fourth chair will be filled, I promise. Uh, Representative Jennifer Conquest had a meeting right before this and she will just like slide right in, I promise. Um, and then we have Senator Janet Peterson, who is from Des Moines. And is a rock star on MSNBC as well. So I think they're gonna have her be a uh, commentator or something. <laughs> Um, Dr. Deborah Turner, who is an OBGYN and an attorney, and the, um, if she hasn't already done enough, national president of Legal Women Voters. Um, so, pretty amazing woman. And Maisie Stilwell with Planned Parenthood. She is the director of public affairs. Interfaith Alliance of Iowa and Action Fund have been fighting for um, people's civil rights for 27 years, and including for the last almost 10 years, working on reproductive health care and bringing that progressive voice of faith and no faith um, to the conversation from our values, from our perspective, and it's an important voice to add to the story. So I am going to turn it over to the panel um, and thank each of you for being here. Here and we'll add Jennifer as she comes in and I'm going to turn it over to Maisie. All right, thank you so much Connie and thank you all for being here and for for showing up and speaking out. I'm I'm fortunate that my senator's on stage with me so I have a have an advantage there so <laughs> but thank you for all of your advocacy. Um, I have a few notes for myself because these are complicated uh, topics. And so I will be starting us off by talking about um, the, the ban itself, uh, giving a, a baseline knowledge on the ban itself, as well as what we have seen transpire in the past uh, 10 days, uh, but something, something like that, I don't know. Um, so uh, for those um, for those who are probably aware, um, last week the Iowa legislature held a one day special session for the sole purpose of banning abortion in uh, in the state of Iowa. And that ban outlaws abortions at around six weeks, which is before most people know that they are pregnant. Uh, immediately after this one day special session in conjunction with the ACLU and the Emma Goldman Clinic, Planned Parenthood filed a lawsuit to block the ban, including a request for a temporary injunction that would immediately block the enforcement of that ban as it works its way through the courts. Uh, the judge granted that injunction on Monday. The judge's order restored access to abortion care while the court considers the lawsuit uh, to permanently block the ban. Now, with that being said, Governor Reynolds has announced her intent to file an appeal to that temporary injunction. Um, I haven't checked in with our litigation team in the last hour or so, so it's certainly possible that that has already 
uh, been filed, but we know that this fight is not over. So I'm going to go into a brief overview of what House File 732 actually says uh, and, and what it doesn't say. Uh, so this bill that we saw passed uh, last Tuesday is nearly identical to the 2018 ban on abortion once cardiac activity is detected. And again, that's usually around six weeks, um, except there's this immediate implementation language. So when this nearly identical ban was passed in 2018, um, there, was, there was time for rules to be written um, before it was implemented versus this one was, was implemented with the governor's signature. Um, this ban on most abortions in Iowa will most significantly impact Iowans who are already marginalized, who face systemic barriers to healthcare and can't travel to a state that actually values their freedom. I am not calling this um, a, a fetal heartbeat bill, and that's the only time you're gonna hear me say that phrase. Um, you may have heard that a lot in the past uh, weeks, months, years, um, but I just want to establish for everyone so that we're all uh, on the same page that um, what we're talking about here is, uh, is not a fetus and there is not a heart, it is embryonic electrical impulses. So, yeah, <laughs> let's be clear uh, and let's be accurate. So um, you may have heard the top line assessment that this ban includes exceptions for rape, incest, miscarriage, fetal abnormality, incompatible with life and medical emergencies. These are useless. These are useless. Each of these so-called exceptions is inaccessible and unworkable. All Iowans deserve access to the full spectrum of reproductive health care, including abortion. Although they may appear to allow access to essential health care for some people, in reality, we've seen the harms of identical bans play out across the country in the year, a year and uh, a year and a few months since the Dobbs ruling overturned Roe v. Wade. So for example, the medical emergency exception that we see written into this bill is, is on par with um, how it's defined in Iowa code is very similar to Idaho, Kentucky, Texas, and Tennessee. And the documented patient harms in each of those states are too many to name. The point is these exceptions don't work and they hurt people, they hurt patients who need essential health care. Uh, so I want to go into just very briefly those exceptions. Um, there's a, a provision in the law that these exceptions only uh, exist up to 20 weeks post fertilization. Um, so the, the exception for rape uh, must be reported to law enforcement or a health agency within 45 days. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but that is six weeks and three days. So um, this, is, this is not an exception at all, and we know that it significantly harms uh, survivors of sexual assault who often do not come forward for a whole multitude of reasons. Um, the, the incest exception must be reported to law enforcement or health agency within 140 days, um, which is 20 weeks. The miscarriage exception um, is only applicable if there is no detectable cardiac activity or not all of the products of conception have been expelled. So this is very technical language, um, but we know that it will lead to inevitable provider confusion um, and that it will result in delays in essential care. We have seen that play out uh, and we have seen across the country people who are waiting um, until their life is at risk or until that cardiac activity is not detectable. Um, or this, this so-called exception for uh, fetal abnormality incompatible with life. Um, this is very narrowly written, especially compared to other bans across the country. Uh, and many people may not even learn about these fetal conditions until after 20 weeks. So even for people who are able to access care before cardiac activity is detected, and again, such a small group uh, who, who falls into that category, physicians will still have to comply 
uh, with existing medically unnecessary and stigmatizing counseling requirements and a 24 hour waiting period. Adding those existing requirements, um, we know that uh, it, even if all of those hoops are jumped through, uh, which is extremely difficult to meet, um, this bill also requires that a physician before performing an abortion uh, confirms that lack of cardiac activity by ultrasound and notifies the pregnant person that the abortion is prohibited if cardiac activity is detected and the physician is required to maintain documentation of the ultrasound and a signed copy of the required disclosure in the patient's medical record. So um, that is an overview of the bill itself. And now I am glad to turn it over to um, my, my wonderful friends on this panel to give you some different perspectives on it. Thank you, Maisie. The amazing Maisie hit it right out of the park. So, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a couple little different things. And I'm going to start out with this statement. Iowa is in an OBGYN desert. Let me say that again. Iowa is an OBGYN desert. We have less OBGYNs in this country than any other state in this country per capita. Think about that. As we've heard recently, someone talked about it's so exciting that I was getting noticed. We're getting noticed for the wrong things, folks. So let's get our act together. So I talk about that. There's an argument that uh, family medicine can take care of most OBGYN needs. And so to that extent, why do we need OBGYNs? Well, I don't know a singly, single family medicine doc he is faced or she is faced with pregnancy issues, doesn't want to have an OBGYN in their back pocket, okay? <laughs> you, there are many things that OBGYNs do that are unique to the specialty. Uh, they do surgery, which can't be done by everyone. They take care, for example, if you have a tubal pregnancy, it, you don't have to have surgery and have the tube removed. But a lot of physicians don't know that, or if they do know it, they don't understand the care of using a methotrexate, which is a chemotherapy drug, basically, to take care of that pregnancy. That is the specialty that OBGYNs learn in their residency. So I really bring this to a point because this makes the point that medicine is a team sport. Every person in the team is important. We use referrals, we use shared care, we use our nurses, our technicians, everybody on the team is critical. And therefore, physicians need other physicians and other providers that have the specialties and can do the things that they can't do, so they have them ready to be referred to. And it is totally appalling that we can't do that in Iowa because the red does it. Now, I also emphasize this issue because I spent this time with two wonderful new physicians who were training at the University of Iowa and OBGYN when I was testifying at the state a couple weeks ago. And as I was talking with them, I said, well, what are you going to do in the future? And they said, well, we had planned on practicing in Iowa, but if this ban persists, we are going to look somewhere else to practice. And they were serious. These are amazing young uh, physicians with great talents, but they're not going to practice in our state. And why aren't they going to practice in our state? Because they want to provide complete and honest care to their physician, to their patients, not dictated by elected officials or legislators or people who have decided that they want their issues above others. They do not want people practicing without a license. They have a license and they can practice well, but they're not going to be told what to do. Okay, so we're going to lose physicians. This is scary to me. It is very scary to me. So as a practicing physician, I'd be appalled if I knew that people were training were leaving my state because of a, a law like this. So let's understand a little bit more the near total ban. What does that mean? Well, Macy did very good about talking about electrical activity because at six weeks, there is no heart that is uh, beating. Okay. But the critical piece in this is that a woman is barely four weeks pregnant when she is called six week. Remember, pregnancy is dated from the date of your last menstrual period. You don't conceive to 14 to 16 days after that. So by the time that six week ban comes down, you're barely four weeks present 
preg pregnant, and most people don't even know that they're pregnant yet. They're pregnant at that time. They have missed their break, their period maybe by two weeks. But let's face it, you know, our bodies aren't mechanic mechanically ordered so that we know exactly and we always have the same time. We miss periods all the time. All the women in this room can tell you that. Okay, uh, they're delayed or whatever, and therefore you may not know you're pregnant. And this becomes very, very difficult. So then when you finally figure this out, you have this two week window in our state. And in that time, you have to find a clinic, you have to find a provider, you have to be seen, you have to wait 24 hours, the clinic's visits are full, there are no places to get scheduled. And so, wow, you're beyond six weeks. So by the law, you basically, so if we look at this six week ban, it really, honestly, truly is basically a total ban. And we're not relieved by what's around us. You know, Missouri is basically a desert. Kansas has restrictions, even though it's in their state. They have lots of restrictions, I just asked. Nebraska just passed a 12-week ban. Illinois is open, but Illinois can only do so many. And the same with Minnesota, which also has some restrictions. So women in Iowa are being penalized, extremely penalized by this law. And finally, before my time runs out here, I want to bring up something that we sometimes don't remember about. There are two laws that every one of you should know about. One is EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Law. That was enacted in 1986, I believe, because of something called dumping, where people would come to an emergency room and they didn't have money. So they would refer them on somewhere else without taking care of them. This is very, very common action. So they passed this law, which requires that everyone make sure they have to have a medical examination. They have to determine if it is an emergency. They have to be stabilized before they can be transferred. And in any hospital that has takes care of Medicare and Medica Medicaid patients has to take them and transfer. That sounds great. So that seems like if you are a woman who's having an emergency around pregnancy, be it a miscarriage or excessive bleeding, you should be taken care of. Well. Here's the problem. You have to determine that it's an emergency and that you're not stable. And physicians and emergency rooms are avoiding making that decision. So they're sending women home. And women are going home, and many of them are bleeding, hemorrhaging, and undoubtedly, some of them are going to die. So this law doesn't protect us. We need to keep our eye on that law. And then the final one is what everybody knows about HIPAA. You've all heard about HIPAA. Every time you go to your doctor's office, you have to sign a thing that they've told you about. It's the Health Insurance Portability and Act Accountability Act. What's it do? It supposedly protects your personal medical information so that I, as a physician, can't give your, Medicaid, your medical history to anybody else unless you give my permission. I can send it to a referring doc or to another hospital if they need it, but really even that is limited in some situations. Well, it turns out there's a little bit of a glitch in the HIPAA law when it comes to reproductive rights. Are we surprised? No. <laughs> no. So HIPAA says that medical uh, entities like Vanderbilt, if you read recently, they turned over lots and lots of medical records without even telling the patients, unfortunately. But you can provide health information if it is required or a, a, excuse me, a law enforcement or a court order. Now, interesting, the HIPAA law says you are allowed to provide it, but it doesn't say you have to provide it. Well, unfortunately, most institutions are taking that to mean you have to provide it and they're not questioning it. So we need to keep an eye on this because this is critical because your health information can be transferred without your knowledge. And this is something that we need to keep an eye on in Iowa, and I'm gonna let my friends here talk about whether that's something that's on the radar screen. Because once again, as a physician, this ticks me off. I'm sorry. If I send your, medicine, your information away, I lose my job. I can lose my license. But some attorney general in the state can come up and say, I want your medical information, and they can get it. That is wrong, and we can't let it happen in Iowa. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turner. And you raised a really important point, which I'll get to in my notes. Um, Connie had asked me to talk about some of the takeaways I had from the special session. And 
Um, my number one takeaway was the fact that our governor was calling us back for a special session to strip the rights away from more than half of the population in the state of Iowa. And if you were to say, um, uh, instead of using women's reproductive health care, men's reproductive health care, and that she was calling us back for a special session, uh, I think people would be even more outraged, unfortunately. Um, the second thing that I thought was so incredibly troubling is something that we've been seeing in the legislature um, since Republicans have taken control, and that is a step away from democracy, moving much more toward dictatorship. Um, if you remember, uh, Senate Republicans uh, made the decision not to allow the media to be on the Iowa Senate floor, which is completely unprecedented. And then in this um, last special session, they changed the rules of debate for the Iowa Senate, limiting amendments and limiting the amount of time for debate, as well as the amount of time for the public to speak, giving women less than three hours to make their case about why their bodies should matter and should be constitutionally protected. Then if you go to the actual um, committee or subcommittee, um, not only were women limited, they, while it was probably 10 to 1, as we know, the majority of Iowans believe um, abortion should be safe and legal in our state, and the majority of people who showed up at the state house that day were opposed to the six-week abortion ban, but the chair of the committee um, made the um, testimony be pro-con, pro-con, pro-con. So it didn't give Iowans a true sense of, of the fact that there were probably 10 times more many people opposed to the bill that wanted to get their stories told that day. Um, Senate Democrats introduced 12 amendments on the floor. None of them were accepted. Um, all of the amendments were done in a way to make sure that there was more clarification because in the testimony we heard um, doctor after doctor and patient after patient and woman after woman expressing their concerns about the bill not being clear. How would you treat a woman who was going through a miscarriage? One doctor raised a concern about an atopic pregnancy how unstable would her patient have to be before she could step in and provide care? And one by one, they um, took down every one of our amendments. We started, we started the debate off um, explaining, we are in a, ma a maternal health crisis in our state right now. And if the governor um, called us in for special session, what she should have called us in for, would be to fix our maternal health care system. We've lost 20 labor and delivery units just since Governor Reynolds has taken over office and privatized Medicaid. Um, black women in our state are six times more likely than white women to die in childbirth. Maternal mortality had more than doubled in the three years leading up to the pandemic before the pam pandemic even began. And um, uh, this legislat uh, legislative Republicans had also barred women from, um, uh, they had also gutted the family planning program. So women were barred, uh, they participated in that program, they were barred from seeing the provider of their choice. Um, any provider that's organization provides abortion care was not allowed to participate. So if you think about that, you know, abortion care is also miscarriage care. So it um, meant that they wouldn't be able to go to many of the top providers in our state, University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, Unity Point, Planned Parenthood to get health screenings and their family planning. So um, Democrats were in favor of us restoring that. Um, we also have concerns about women in our state are dropped off of Medicaid 60 days after they give birth to a baby. Um, more than 40 states across the country have expanded Medicaid to um, 12 months. And Senate Republicans voted against that um, just two months ago. Um, they voted again against it on the floor. Um, the other, the other thing I will say, um, you know, uh, 
Right now, the political climate is not kind to new parents. I just um, attended a child care meeting at the White House this week, hearing about the wonderful things that states across the country are doing with the federal dollars that they've been given. And when they heard that instead of doing wonderful things with our child care dollars for new parents, our governor, um, she enlisted the strictest work requirements on a new mom 32 hours a week in order to get any ounce of childcare assistance. If that mom loses a shift at work um, and doesn't make the 32 hours a week in a month, she'll be dropped from childcare. Um, the provider will also be dropped their paycheck from that family. Um, so we have a very penalizing system for new parents. And so those were some of the concerns that we raised in debate. Um, we also raised concerns about um, girls being included in the legislation. And um, uh, as you know, our state has one of the worst track records for um, child sex abuse in the country and they were unwilling to protect and exclude girls. I have a few more things to say, but I know that Connie has given me the wrap up. So if anyone wants to ask me for the rest of my points later, I'll be happy to fill you in. Well, now I'm scared. So hi everyone, I'm sorry I was late. I'm Jennifer Converse, I am the leader in the House uh, Democrats. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I don't have a lot to add, and I surely don't want the Connie hook, so I will just, uh, you know how she is. Um, I will just quickly give you a few updates from the House perspective. So um, we've been having the same norms that Senator Peterson talked about um, that are being broken in the Senate. They've been being broken in the House for a few years now, so we expected to be limited in our debate time, and we expected to have very narrowly drawn um, rules that would make it so that most amendments were um, not even willing to be considered. So we had, uh, we, we knew that, so, and you knew that too, but dif different. We, we're used to being treated like crap over in the house and <laughs> welcome to our life. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we, we talked about um, how we want, what votes we wanted to get the majority party on so that we could use them against them in a campaign. We're not gonna talk about campaigns, Connie, I'm not doing that. I'm just, you know, generally speaking. Um, and I'm just gonna give you some facts. I'm not gonna put judgment on them, I'm just gonna let you know some things. So uh, we introduced uh, eight amendments uh, that were considered out of order. Um, so they were not debated on the floor. Um, we knew that, uh, but we wanted them to call them out of order so that we could say they didn't do them. And then we considered three. And we got solid votes on three amendments. And I'm just going to tell you the breakdown, um, just for facts. Um, we had an amendment that would have uh, extended out the um, the rape and incest exemptions to a 20 week and getting rid of some of those um, onerous requirements voted down. Um, one Rep Republican voted with us, with all Democrats, just a fact. Um, we also had a, an amendment that would have uh, expanded and explained a little bit more what miscarriage um, care would look like. It was um, including adding mental health services to a reason for an abortion, a few things in there. Uh, voted down all Democrats, one Republican. Uh, and then we had an amendment that we thought we'd get them on because who is going to vote for this um, against this amendment, which is that if you're under 12, um, you are not forced to carry a child to term. I think it's wrong that a 17 year old or a 38 year old is forced to carry a pregnancy to term, but I was trying to get in their heads and that's not a good place to be. And so um, <laughs> here we are. Um, all uh, Republicans but one voted against it, including very vulnerable Republicans in very targeted districts, just FYI. Um, and then, and that's just really interesting information for me to have in the next 475 days. Um, and others will know about that too. I want you to know that um, the vote in the House was a bipartisan opposition, or um, bipartisan opposition and partisan support. Two Republicans voted against the bill in the House. One, because it didn't go far enough for um, when abortion was illegal. And one, quoted in the paper, Senator Representative Zach Deacon said it's because there were no punishments for women in the bill. Aww. So let's not give them any credit. Okay, <laughs> they weren't no's because they see the light. They were no's because it didn't punish women enough, which tells you a lot about where things stand. So um, in our debate, we heard a lot of things that I find to be relatively troubling and we're seeing as trends, one of which is 
calling every fetus or embryo a girl. Um, this is a move they're doing to show that they're defending women and they're feminists, right? Um, and so that happened. Uh, and uh, a lot of talk about what about the baby? What about the baby? What about the baby? Why are you not considering the baby's rights? Um, we, I wanted to stand up and say what baby, but that would have probably not gone well. There is no baby. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but you know, we really, I felt like in both the House and the Senate continued to point out flaws in their arguments. Um, the number one is that you were not, you did not run on this. You were not elected to do this. And um, you're saying that you were, but we know that there's at least one um, state representative who knocked on doors and told, told constituents he was pro-choice. He is not, um, and just lies. So it's kind of hard to compete when people lie. Um, but if you're in Johnston, you should know that, just FYI. <laughs> I'm going to get that hook any minute. Um, I can talk a lot about a lot of things that went wrong, a lot of things that uh, we were proud of. Um, you know, we know Iowans are with us. House Democrats have introduced um, a four-part plan um, that's people over politics plan, and one of our planks is reproductive freedom. That includes things like a constitutional amendment to enshrine abortion in our state constitution so we don't have to constantly ask for our rights every few years, um, including expanding postpartum care for Medicaid, which Senator Peterson talked about, and uh, over-the-counter birth controls and things like that. So um, we aren't just up there to say no, we're up there to talk about what we're for, and we believe that's really important. So the number of people supporting abortion rights and reproductive freedom in the country is growing. It's also growing in Iowa. The last thing I will say is that faith is really a key component of this um, issue to me, and I know to a lot of us. Uh, it was right here in this building when Faith Foray asked me in 1987 if I wanted to go to a rally and if I wanted to go to a political event. And Faith Foray took me to a NARAL rally in 1987, and it was my political awakening. It was the first time I ever got involved in politics because I had no idea when I grew up somebody could tell me what to do with my body, and I was displeased. And so um, for me, this has always been an issue about the, the freedom and autonomy that God gives me and um, the ability to make my own decisions and do live a life that I think is worth living based on my decisions and my choices, not the ones that um, David Young tells me to make. So um, look, we've got a big fight ahead. There are a lot of battles and challenges that you're gonna hear about. And there is a movement that says, please stop telling people to vote. That's not going to work. I understand that argument, I do. I'm just saying, how's about both? How about we take care of women who need care between now and election day and we vote like hell on election day? Seems to me like that's a good balance. So we are fighting to try that because we can do all we can for women in office or women who, with them too, but for women who need abortion care between now and then. But until the laws are changed, we are limited. And until the legislature makeup is different, we are limited. So voting cannot not be an option. So we've got to do both. So I hear the arguments about don't just tell us to vote harder. I hear that and I feel it. I'm saying let's vote and let's also take care of women in the meantime. So. I'm not really that mean. <laughs> We all got the wrap up. <laughs> but with four panelists, we do want to make sure that we have time for questions as well. So we gave them a time limit. So, and they did awesome. Um, it is our practice with Crossroads that we, you just raise your hand and I bring the microphone to you. And if I um, can avoid going back and forth, um, I will, but uh, it, that just may happen. So um, I would also encourage you not to give um, a lot of testimony. We want questions so that um, folks can get those out there. Um, and if you want to direct it to one panelist, you can, or if you just do it generically, then that's fine as well, and somebody will answer. Um, I just want to know what would be the consequences of a woman, a young woman, any woman, that would have a abortion in Iowa secretly or, um, or just um, not reported, 
but then was found out that she had an abortion, what are the consequences of her? Is she, uh, her and the doctor, or if it wasn't a doctor, whoever, are there any consequences in the law? Are, well, that's a really good question. The law does say that it won't criminalize um, women and girls, but we're finding out that that maybe is not the case. And one um, thing I'd like to point out to all of you is that um, we tried to make sure that um, physicians and providers would not be criminalized. They did not accept that amendment, nor could they tell us um, whether or not they would be protected. And we all know we have a new attorney general, Brenna Bird, who has already cut off emergency contraceptive care and abortion care to children who are victims of sexual assault. And um, the funds that are available for that are not taxpayer funds. And she has yet to give the media or myself a response on when she will allow those funds to move forward. Um, the Board of Medicine is charged with putting in place rules on the legislation. And if any of you have followed the Board of Medicine in the news recently, you'll see that our governor has, um, has not filled all the positions. There's five Republicans, three independents, and two vacant spots. This is the same Board of Medicine that for the past three years has gaslit a mandatory reporter who has come forward about a doctor with um, a sexual assault history. She has asked repeatedly for them to revoke his license. And in those three years that they have not revoked his license, he went on to sexually assault an eight-year-old and they have yet to revoke his license. Now that board of medicine is now in charge of the rules pertaining to every girl and woman's uterus in the state of Iowa. Um, they will have 90 days. I reached out to the board yesterday because I do believe the public should be able to weigh in and doctors who will have their license on the line should be able to weigh in. They have yet to put a public schedule out. Um, they have yet to release which sections of the bill that they're willing to um, write rules for. So it's very alarming. And even as the judge blocked the bill, the judge did not block the rules from being written. So we need to be vigilant and paying attention to make sure that um, we don't have county prosecutors and our AG going after young girls and women on other charges and digging into their medical history. Hi, thank you everybody. Um, last Friday, my sister sat late in a cot in a hallway in an emergency department in Des Moines. And I heard the medical histories of people all around in the hallways. And I'm thinking, you know, Deb, you, you talked about HIPAA. And one of my concerns and thoughts while you were talking was, okay, what if they're on a cot in a hallway of ER, like my sister was, and not getting any care, and there aren't any beds because there's not any, st any staff enough nurses, nursing staff to care for them. And so they're closing units or keeping units closed. What's gonna happen with HIPAA, with women going through these circumstances? That is a very, really critical thing. And this goes to show again where our state money should go. We need money that's supporting emergency rooms, hospitals, and we need plans and basically, uh, um, movement by our legislature and our state to get more providers, more nurses in our hospitals. And until that happens, we're gonna see this. But by and large, when that happens, it should be reported because you have a right to keep your medical information private. And so if you're hearing the medical information from others, they're hearing it about you, so you should report it up the line. You go to the nurse, you go to the head of the hospital, whatever. They don't want to have these cases against them about HIPAA violations in that way. So therefore, I think that you should say anybody is on, the onus is on you to say, hey, my rights were violated. And there is a provision in the HIPAA law to actually uh, bring a case for privacy violation. So it should be done. 
just a question with with all of the restrictions that may exist um, is there any plan for people to assist marginalized women to get out of state to get the care they need i would certainly be willing to help with that yes yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And, and it's a very important one and one that we're uh, getting a lot. Um, Planned Parenthood has abortion navigators, a team of abortion navigators who um, work with patients who are seeking care to help them navigate the many hoops that they have to jump through. So whether that is helping them get care within the state or um, helping them to travel out of state and also helping them to identify uh, resources for things like paying for childcare and getting transportation uh, and lodging. So these are all um, various considerations that our incredible abortion navigators are, are helping people with and figuring out what their options are. Uh, we also work closely with partners on this, on this front. We know that um, the uh, Iowa Abortion Access Fund helps pay for uh, the cost of procedures itself. Um, there's the Midwest Access Coalition, which helps with some of those uh, supplemental costs like the transportation. And so uh, we do have those teams of people that we're, that, you know, we can always use more of them. <laughs> um, but there are so many different considerations. And, and we know that a lot of people who are seeking abortion care do have kids at home already and have, you know, can't, can't get the time off of work. And that's why we know that these bans disproportionately affect people. Um, without the means to just pick up and, and travel to another state. So uh, certainly I would say a, a work in progress, but something that um, you know, Planned Parenthood has been preparing for um, every, you know, everything that we can, knowing that this was likely to be inflicted on Iowans. And so um, that's a great program to support, as well as the, the partner effort that goes into that to make sure that those funds and resources are available for those who need them. I will also just add that Interfaith Alliance of Iowa has been in conversation for a year um, with clergy and faith leaders um, across the state. And so if you have are part of a house of worship, if you are clergy or faith leader, you can contact me and we have a group of folks who are in conversation about how to be um, helpful and supportive as well as a partner organization. We have a question online. Their question is, where or what are the stricter punishments for the impregnator of a child? I think that was rhetorical. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still waiting. <laughs> I'm sure there will be a special session for that. Too. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about where this bill originated? I'm concerned about bills that show up at the legislature that have nothing to do with Iowans or things that we value in Iowa. Well, this one, um, you can Google language from it and see language like this in Texas and Tennessee, I think at least. Um, there is a very strong network of uh, conservative lawmaking groups out there who work to write legislation that just gets copied and pasted. My freshman year at the legislature, there was one that had Tennessee in it still. <laughs> and uh, the drafter didn't catch it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, there's a lot of that going on, a lot of out of state things. And look, I think that underlines and underscores the point that this was not something that was done because Iowans asked for it. This was something done because special interests wanted it and because it helps with a certain base. And so that is not how we're supposed to be legislating. That's not what we're up there to do. And so it is without question outside the realm of what elected officials are supposed to do when it comes to listening to their constituents. So it is another demonstration of listening to special interests, not voters. Thank you. I'm the Reverend Bridget Stevens. My pronouns are she, her, and I am uh, Gen X raising Gen Z. Me too. Uh huh. <laughs> and um, they're brilliant and they're amazing and they are angry and they don't care about voting. Mm -hmm. So I love because it doesn't work. Like this is a legit it argument. It does from them. though. Because I know. people did it from from their perspective. <laughs> it's not working. 
So I love the slogan, vote and, yes. I'm going to steal that or <laughs> take it further, amplify it. What's the and? Yeah. I'll give you some ideas that I would love to see our youth work on. Um, and one is period healthcare. Um, you know, we've had bills in the legislature year after year. Um, we know that there are kids that can't go to school because they don't have access to period products. Um, there's no reason why they shouldn't be fighting for that right now to get every school building to every public building to have period products available to them. Um, you know, and people who don't have their period anymore can't get health insurance coverage for what they need, hormonal care, you know, Viagra, we spend millions of dollars on Viagra um, on your taxpayer dollars, um, but um, hormone care for women is another area. So I think the youth need to get involved in, um, in starting to deliver the message of that we deserve health care from the time we're little girls. An eight-year-old shouldn't have to bring a tampon to the Capitol for a tour in case she might get her period. But that's what happened. A little girl came to the state house for her very first time to see the Capitol and got her period and had no tampon. That's ridiculous. So get the kids involved and help them. Help them. We can, we can start making change. We, you know, I, I brought a legislation forward for us to start providing period products in our rest areas. It would have cost about $8,000. Every Republican voted it down. $8,000. Um, I worked as a lawyer, so I, I'm innocent with uh, medical information. This is a medical question. What about the abortion pill? Is it uh, barred or what's the status of it now? And if we can still use it, does it make, what kind of impact does it make on the total number of abortions in Iowa? Sure, absolutely. That's a great question. So um, I, I recently had the opportunity to correct uh, the opposition who insisted that medication abortion was uh, killing people and, and was very unsafe. Uh, it's actually safer than Tylenol. Um, so this is incredibly safe. Uh, that is something that is still available in Iowa uh, within the same parameter. It, it is treated uh, just like any other abortion. And so whether abortion is procedural or medication, um, that would be governed under the same set of laws. So right now, because of the temporary injunction, we know that uh, abortion remains safe and legal in Iowa today. Um, again, I, I can't tell you what it means tomorrow, uh, but today uh, abortion pills are an option um, through 11 weeks uh, of pregnancy and are extremely safe and effective. Um, there are some some resources out there for being able to get those through the mail, uh, things like that. But uh, what I can tell you is that that is still an option. It is incredibly safe. Um, but we also know that, and it is 80%, I want to say, 80% of abortions uh, in Iowa with the most recent data were uh, were via medication. And so it's very common. Uh, we also saw a bill propose this most recent legislative session that would ban all medication abortion. So it is uh, it is not safeguarded. Uh, it is very much under threat and it is very safe and we should protect it. Anything to add? No, I agree 100%. Uh, and like I said, we did at least 80% of our abortions at Planned Parenthood using the pill. And the key is that it has very few side effects, but it does have some. But the real issue with using it and what we have to protect, we're going back to HIPAA and EMTALA, is that if you do have one and you have an issue with bleeding or that, and that's gonna be less than 1%. I mean, that's how minimal the side effects are from the thing. But if you have a problem and you go to an emergency room, once again, we come back to how does the doctor decide, is this an emergency or you had an abortion leading up to this and am I gonna treat you? So once again, we have to come back to what we do with the law to make sure that we keep it safe. Just so folks know, I have about three or four people who have questions. Catch my eye, and I'll bring the microphone to you until we have we run out of time. 
Okay, question. Um, it, it was kind of common knowledge anymore that a lot of the people who were lobbying for issues used to go to Washington, and now they've discovered that it's easier to hit the states up for change, things that we don't recognize, which I think a lot of what you've alluded to. The question is, who is the money? You know, I always say, follow the money. So who is it we're really battling against? Because before you used to be able to talk to your representatives and say, I don't believe in this, and that's not the case anymore. So what's the money force that's driving this whole, I mean, everything is going on, abortion and everything. You know, who is it we're really battling against? So I think, I mean, I'm just going to just go out there and say a family leader is a huge um, influence on the Republican Party right now financially, but also they have seven lobbyists at the Capitol. It's one of the largest groups of lobbyists at the Capitol. The family leader, Bob Vanderblatt's group, designated by the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group. Um, and they're huge. They have disproportionate in, um, influence on legislators. Nationally, Alec, um, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, big money folks, you know, the folks who are behind the courts, things like that. But I like to draw attention to the family leader here in Iowa. Um, I can't describe to you how much influence they have. Bob Vanderplatt's failed Republican governor candidate um, continues to do this. Three times. Three times. I thought you were telling me to shut up. <laughs> Three times. So, um, but he's. And I'll tell you, this is just a quick thing and we'll get a question. I have a policy in my office that anybody can come in. Um, anyone is welcome. Uh, we've changed that policy now. Um, Moms for Liberty and uh, Bob, our family leader and anyone who's been designated a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center is not welcome in my office anymore. And uh, I wish they had the same rule upstairs. Um, well, great. This is wonderful. And uh, thank you. Oops. This is wonderful. So thank you for being here and spending this time with us. I was um, at the Capitol um, last week, as a lot of you all were. And um, I, I have a question and then an observation. My question is, from Planned Parenthood, are the demographics available for women that receive your services and, and families that receive your services for abortion care, are they available? And would they provide some insights that could be beneficial for all of us to know about? It seems that it's not just, you know, young women or young repeat women that are using it as a means of birth control, which was the statement that I heard when I was speaking with a representative from Northwest Iowa that was very much digging into the fact that that's all it was. And why would we be aborting full-term babies the day before delivery? So while I you know, feel that all the nomenclature surrounding you know, ban the bans against my body, I'm wondering if the, the previous legislation that dealt with 20 weeks, um, you know, now seems awfully good. <laughs> you know, from where we were, from what we have now, or 22 weeks, perhaps. Um, but, but what do you say as, what do we all say as talking points back to someone who's talking about, you know, the day before delivery? So help us out. Thank you so much. <laughs> so fortunately, we have uh, numbers and facts on our side. Um, and not just whatever kind of pulled out of thin air uh, we're hearing there. Um, what I can tell you is that, um, you know, we hear a lot about this, you know, what is what is reasonable legislation? What does that look like? And, um, and what I'll tell you is that a ban is a ban, plain and simple, and they don't belong in our state making decisions for what people can do with their bodies. And so, what what we know is that um, politicians and judges don't belong in that calculation. Uh, it is doctors and patients who need to be making those decisions. And so that's where uh, that's where we draw the line. We say um, it's simply none of your business. <laughs> um, and and, you know, we you know, we can certainly get into the weeds on where where where. Um, you know, the decision to have an abortion is is actually happening and um, 
we can get into that, but ultimately I think what's just important to remind people of is that you are welcome. You, you know, every legislator is welcome to have their own personal beliefs, whether those are guided by their religion, whether those are guided by um, their, their own personal history, whatever that may be, they are welcome to hold those beliefs. They are not welcome to inflict those beliefs on every Iowan. Um, and so this, this idea um, of, you know, abortion up until the moment of birth, I, 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 that's infanticide, it's illegal, it's not real, um, it's completely made up, and uh, we prefer to deal with, with facts. But the question about, you know, who Planned Parenthood is serving, you know, Planned Parenthood is, uh, is always proud to provide care no matter what and, and be that trusted resource in communities. And we know that um, our patients that, that Planned Parenthood serves are often those who are already facing significant barriers to care. And so uh, we see a lot of, um, uh, of patients of color, of patients with low incomes, patients um, seeking care from rural areas, um, LGBTQ uh, patients who are um, often pushed out of the healthcare system. And so it is the people who are, who are already systemically marginalized in our communities that are most often seeking care. And that's what we, who, you know, the stories that we hope to uplift and, and make it clear that whatever your reason is for making those healthcare decisions, that's a good reason for you. And that's a good enough reason for us. I have a question. Um, is there any expectation as this might move to the Iowa Supreme Court whether or not um, Justice Oxley would recuse herself again based on her experience as an attorney with a firm that supported the uh, work of the uh, Cedar Rapids Pine Parenthood Group. Sure. Um, you know, the, the justices don't have to give any reason for recusing themselves on a case. And so we have no idea um, whether or not she would make that choice in the future. Uh, we just hope that all justices would hear the case and uh, the justice would prevail for Iowans in that in that case that we're pre prepared to fight all the way through the Supreme Court. I recently read an interesting statistic that told me that women are only fertile for 3% of their lives while men are fertile for 100% of theirs. Um, and that we might be placing the onus on um, the wrong person. So are there ways that we could perhaps, you know, encourage those who should take the most responsibility for unwanted pregnancy to take the appropriate actions? Do, I, do, do any practitioners have insight on that or others? I mean, I don't know what to say other than our society really just hates women. And so, I mean, getting, <laughs> I mean, right, so societally getting men to take responsibility is, I got, we got other stuff to worry about, right? So, I mean, yes, that is all true. The, the, we would love to raise the responsibility of men. A lot of those amendments, we got a lot of requests for amendments to, you can picture them all. One of them's a Monty Python song, right? Like we know all the things we could do. Um, to make the points we wanted to make and the limitations were so narrow and frankly it was so serious we didn't want to do any of that but um, yeah I mean there are a lot of things that we could be doing to encourage it but I think we have to understand that all of this is at its core an issue about the subjugation of women and this is all about making sure women are controlled and that's a core issue we have to understand in our society before we can move forward. I, I also want to bring up that um, our state is the worst state for sexual violence and um, under this law you would force a child who was raped to carry the rapist baby no and no matter what the age of the child and uh, children in our state are barred from seeking civil damages for something even as simple as covering therapy costs for being sexually assaulted. They are barred from the civil courtroom by the age of 19 and sometimes even sooner. And it is the worst law in the, in the country. And they have just um, put, um, they've given more rights to rapists in the six week abortion ban than they've given to our children. And they've been unwilling to do any legislation that would work on teaching consent um, to young people. And if you look at all of the books that they've banned 
in our schools that put children even at more risk um, by not talking about their bodies and um, knowing that they may be sexually assaulted because they want those books off of the shelf. Um, we're heading into some really scary times. Help me to thank our panelists. I guess I would like to say, and I'm going to be really bold here and speak for all of us up here on this stage, that first of all, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate your interest. And I really want us to think about this, the comment about the, the men. It's an onus on the men that are here to talk to other men. It's like, it's not the duty of me as a black person to get rid of racism in America. It's the duty of white people to get rid of America. So you got to go to the force and say, okay, I put it on you guys that are in this audience to start talking. But more than that, finally, just a real quick statement. We are not, we should not be defined by our politics. We should be defined by our democracy. And more importantly, we should be defined by our humanity. And that's how we're going to win. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you. Thank you to those of you who are online. If you give me a, just a half a second. Um, we do this luncheon every month. This is one of the best luncheons that we have ever had. And I'm just grateful for each of you. Next month, we're going to talk about another really easy topic. And that's all of the limitations that the legislature has put on educators. So whether it is, I told you it's an easy subject, right? So banning books and don't say gay and trans and like the whole list, right? And we have Dr. Ryan Wise um, coming to speak. He is the Dean of Education um, at Drake University and um, was a teacher and also was in the Branstead and Reynolds administration. So it's gonna be a fascinating conversation. And um, so I invite you to come back. Please do make your reservation ahead of time. Um, and I hope that the room will be full with that, with that um, event. One thing that I want to add to the list of things that y'all can do is to give money. Give money to Planned Parenthood. Give money to um, the Iowa Abortion Access Fund. Yes, you can give money to Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, but that's not the point. No, it's really not. Like, give money to the providers who are doing this work, Emma Goldman, et cetera, um, because they need your help, they need your support. Um, the Iowa Abortion Access Fund is one of the best organiza organizations to give money to because they give grants to young people, to not young people who need access to care, and they are going to help um, move people if needed to places um, that are actually providing that care. So I, I, we need you to do that. And we need you to continue to raise your voice. We need you, last week was not the end, right? And we need you to continue to listen to Planned Parenthood, listen to Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, listen to all of the organizations that are doing this work. And when we ask you to contact legislators, we really do need you to do that. So um, whether or not your legislator is friendly or not, um, we need you to do that. So um, I've kept you long enough. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being online. And I hope that you have a, a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you.